Okay. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Harsha from uh, Purdue University. Uh, I'm in the School of Industrial Engineering there. Uh, and uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, very kind of them. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about uh, some work that I've been doing over the past year and a half uh, with my colleague, Minayak Rao, who is in the Statistics Department, and uh, Pratik Jaswal, who is my student uh, in the School of Industrial Engineering. And I'm going to talk about uh, variational Bayes, uh, try to give you an overview of this methodology, and uh, present some recent results that we have uh, proved about the statistical properties of these methods, uh, and also point out the rest of the literature, at least some of the rest of the literature. You're not the only ones who are working on this stuff. Um, and I'll also talk about certain risk-sensitive formulations of this methodology uh, that come out of, uh, you know, sort of OR, operations research uh, motivations. And that will become clear as we go along. And I should also acknowledge uh, our supporters, uh, National Science Foundation and the Purdue Research Foundation. Uh, okay, so here's an overview. Uh, of the talk, I'll start with motivation and specifically the optimization problem that we uh, were looking to solve and sort of led us down this path of thinking about uh, variational Bayes. Um, you know, once you start thinking about uh, this question in the way that we were thinking about it, you immediately start asking yourself, how do I compute posteriors? And then we want to understand certain asymptotic properties of these approximate posteriors. Uh, and then I'll go come back to uh, the stochastic optimization problem and talk about certain fact type bounds that we prove. And what I call is the optimality gap, that will become clear what that means uh, as we go along. Hopefully I'll have enough time to uh, present one uh, numerical result, but as Eric pointed out yesterday, that doesn't matter here, so that's good. And then end with some conclusions. Okay, uh, so let's start with the motivation. So the type of problem that we wanted to solve is a stochastic optimization problem of this type. Uh, L here is a loss function. Uh, typically, one would assume that it's Lipschitz, differentiable, could be non-convex. Um, psi is the random object. It's assumed to have a density function that's parameterized by some theta. There could be some cer uh, certain local covariates, Z. So the model is general. Right here, that doesn't really matter. Uh, we will assume that this so-called design space or the action space is compact. And so if you think about this uh, problem, it's actually exactly what uh, Gerson uh, presented yesterday in the open problem session, uh, at least a version of this type of problem. And the decision A here does not affect the stochasticity uh, side, the distribution. There is no connection between the two. But uh, you know, if you knew the, the distribution completely, then this is a deterministic optimization problem. Stick it into a you know, deterministic optimi uh, optimization package and then call it a day, right? You're done. The issue is that you don't actually know the distribution. And uh, how do you then solve such problems? And you know, the motivation for uh, this type of problem, at least in uh, my context, is something like uh, a system design problem. So uh, those of you who know me, know me as a queuing theorist. So I've sort of done a lot of work on uh, queues. And one of the questions that uh, comes up a lot is how do you design a queuing system that has enough servers to uh, serve incoming jobs at a certain rate? Right, so this is like a classic stochastic optimization problem. And you want to choose these uh, servers as a function of the arrival and service time distributions. And um, you know, typically, you would choose the number of servers to minimize some uh, loss function. That could be some performance level, expected performance level. It could be you know, achieving a certain performance level with high probability and so on. Okay? The, the question is, you know, what happens when you don't know uh, these arrival and service time distributions. How do you solve these types of problems in data-driven settings? So you end up in this question of how do we make optimal decisions when we only have access to random samples of certain uh, you know, observations of our system. Okay? And so we don't know the, uh, the full stochasticity is not revealed to us. We only have samples. So you have to, in some sense, estimate the underlying distribution, plug it into uh, your optimization problem, and solve that. And of course, this is not a new problem. People have been thinking about this for ages. And so there's a bunch of standard methods that one can use to solve this type of problem. Uh, I'll just go, briefly go through them. Uh, one really well-known uh, method is this so-called sample average approximation. And typically here, and this would actually be a special case of what was presented in the open problem session yesterday. So typically, one would assume that this psi i is iid, 
uh, you can obtain these IID samples. You formulate a sample average uh, of the objective, and then you minimize that. So this is sort of saying that I completely trust the empirical distribution function, and I'm going to plug it into my optimization problem and then solve this empirical uh, objective. Um, this is perhaps too much, right? So in some sense, you're saying that the random sample that I have is fully representative in some sense. So people have, uh, in the literature, there's been a lot of work recently on the so-called distributionally robust optimization methods. And, uh, you know, this literature is vast, so, uh, you know, I'm being a little bit, um, uh, you know, uh, risky here by just saying that it's this version. Um, so you turn this optimization problem into a minimax optimization, where I'm going to look at the worst case measure over some set of measures that are centered at the empirical distribution. So that's what this represents. There's some distance measure that one can use here. People use all types of distance measures. You know, there's um, uh, KL um, versions of this, uh, kullback leibler uh, There is uh, Washerstein, uh, DRO. You know, there's endless, uh, you know, there's an entire zoo of uh, methods here. So essentially, this is more robust in the sense that you're not fully trusting the empirical distribution, but then you're bringing in some uh, understanding of the problem and choosing this family Q here. Okay, so um, these are sort of empirical methods. In the first yeah. one, we don't need to agree that the eyes are IID. You don't have to. Yeah, so you don't have to. to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you can. You, this could actually be coming out of a Markov chain, for instance. For instance. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, these are sort of uh, you know, if, if you're a statistician, and when I talk to Vinayak, th these types of things come out. He says that these are frequentist methods, right? Um, whatever that means. Uh, but if you think about the problem that we're trying to solve, we have a finite sample of data. We, in some sense, want to predict the future state of the world and then make decisions with respect to those future uh, predictions. And what do I mean by that? I want to solve something that looks like this, right? So I have xn here, which is my uh, sample. f of y given xn is my prediction the, to the best of my ability of, uh, you know, the, what I believe is the state of the world, the size, so to speak. And then I want to minimize this uh, objective. And in, the, in a Bayesian setting, you would sort of say that, okay, I don't necessarily know which model, you know, generated the data. So let me sort of amortize my ignorance by averaging over all possible models. So I'm going to think about a purely parametric framework here and say that each of these thetas uh, represents a particular model f of y given theta, this likelihood here. And then I'm going to average over, uh, over them by using this posterior distribution. Okay, so this is a very classic way of thinking about this problem. Um, and more generally, you know, the problems that we are interested in sort of forces to think about uh, risk measures, right? So we are worried about tail risks, and I'll point out, uh, you know, a reason for that later on. And so, you know, in, rather than optimizing this expected loss, one might wish to optimize uh, a risk measure of the loss, okay? And uh, in this specific talk, one can think of other risk measures. Um, I'm gonna talk about this log exponential risk measure. So this is just one example. And we'll come back to this uh, log exponential risk measure. So and this is where the term risk sensitive comes from. Okay, and risk sensitivity is something that has been studied in uh, Control theory, uh, PR Kumar was here yesterday, he's done some work on this, Vivek Borker, and also in economics. Um, nonetheless, if you adopt this perspective, which we have, um, you immediately run into this question of, okay, how do I compute this posterior, right? Gamma is negative or positive here? It could be positive or negative. I'll, I'll point it out, yeah. Um, yeah, but, and I didn't say this, but uh, gamma sort of measures your sensitivity to sort of tail effects. Okay, so how do you compute the posterior distribution? So uh, Eric already sort of gave us a nice introduction to this question. So uh, I will merely, con uh, you know, summarize what he said uh, and talk about posterior computation a little bit. Um, so just to recall, what is the posterior distribution? Uh, essentially, I'm given this likelihood function. So this could, this is typically a product of, uh, you know, if you have an IID sample, then this would just be a product of uh, density functions. Uh, pi of theta is my prior. So this is something that as a modeler I get to choose. Um, you know, uh, in operations research, um, people tend to choose what are called as conjugate priors here. And uh, the reason why they do that is so that this whole computation here becomes easy. So 
In reality, this computation is super hard because you cannot easily compute this integral in the denominator. But if you choose a conjugate prior, then this sort of turns into a trivial non-computation effectively. Okay? And so we are interested in situations where you cannot choose a conjugate prior, which is actually almost every situation in reality. So how do you do this is the question. And if you think about this, this uh, problem, um, so the, the stuff that Eric talked about uh, over the last couple of days was to say, okay, forget about actually trying to calculate this thing. Let's just sample from it. Let's just get samples from it. So if our objective uh, you know, uh, is to just obtain samples, then you can do Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is a very standard procedure for doing this. And there are many, many, again, there's a zoo of methods here. Uh, you know, the Langevin method was presented. Uh, and Metropolis Hastings was also presented. Um, broadly speaking, uh, you know, you just construct a Markov chain whose stationary distribution is precisely the posterior. And then hopefully after some time, once you've burnt in your uh, uh, process, you are sampling from the posterior distribution. That's roughly speaking what, what goes on. And of course, the question is, how do you actually construct this Markov chain? And that's a subtle issue. And you know, there's a lot of research that goes into this question. It is provable that as k goes towards infinity, this uh, Markov chain is going to be you know, uh, coming from the uh, stationary distribution, which is precisely the posterior. And of course, the nice thing here is that you can stick these samples into any nice functional. Uh, well, again, nice being the operative word there. Uh, but the ergodic theorem tells us that this thing is going to converge as k goes towards infinity to this average, which is precisely what we wanted. right? So this is good. Um, however, and I'm sure I might get some pushback here, but <laughs> Uh, this can suffer from high variance. Uh, there is this question of you know, how quickly will it converge? How do I know that I'm close enough to the posterior? There's this question of burn-in. You know, how long do I have to run this before I can be confident uh, that I'm getting the posterior samples? And so you, know, you end up with some fairly complex diagnostics. And we saw part of this, you know, the scaling with dimension you know, can be pretty complex of these algorithms. So uh, machine learners sort of saw this problem. Um, and they said, okay, let's try something else. And of course, in many OR applications, we actually would like to have access to the posterior, not merely samples from it. Okay? And sort of that's uh, the setting that we are in. So we want the posterior itself. So how do we compute that approximately? Okay? So uh, if you think about this uh, posterior computation problem, a very standard result in Bayesian statistics is you can sort of state it as a variational optimization of this form. So let's say that script M represents all densities over the metal, uh, model space. That's all densities. And then I'm going to do a, KL, a minimization of the kullback leibler divergence between uh, all of these uh, densities and the uh, true posterior uh, distribution, or the posterior density. And clearly, I mean, the posterior density is in that uh, space, so you would pick it out, right? So in some sense, this is not really telling us much, but you know, because it's not a really a, a useful computational insight. But machine learners had to look at this, and they said, hey, wait a second. So what if we just restricted ourselves to a subset here, a subset over which we can actually do you know, nice computations and simplify certain integrals that we need to compute? And so if you choose a nice quote unquote subset of measures, then you get a, uh, an upper bound here. So you solve this problem. and uh, and so you're getting an approximate posterior distribution, which you can actually compute. Okay, so this is all of variational base. This is it. Okay. Of course, there's, there's one important point, which I hope you've caught, which is I don't actually know the posterior. That's the object that I'm trying to compute, right? And I'm sticking it into my optimization. So this is a little bit of a chicken and egg type of situation. So uh, the, the key insight in variational base is that actually, if you take this uh, KL divergence and you this, you know, crank the algebra engine a little bit. You can write it down in this form. And you immediately observe that this term here, this, uh, the third term, does not depend on Q at all. And that is precisely the thing that's in the denominator, that integral in the denominator, the so-called model evidence. And that doesn't depend on Q. So I can ignore it completely in my optimization and just focus on this so-called elbow. Elbow is evidence lower bound, okay? So, Essentially, minimizing the scale is equivalent to maximizing this elbow function. And that is what people do in variational base. OK, so any questions about this? OK, there are no questions. Uh, so 
uh, you know, K, if you look at this and you think, okay, why KL? I mean, clearly this is one motivation, this uh, theorem, uh, this sort of standard fact in Bayesian uh, statistics. But one can, of course, stick in other things, right? I mean, there's no, nothing stopping you from doing that. Yeah. Uh, you mean this, this thing here? Yeah, you can do it with any. Like, you can do this algebra manipulation and get what you need. So here are a few, okay. Um, so one really famous one is the so-called expectation propagation uh, by Thomas Minker, um, which also came out around the time of uh, KLVB. Uh, so I'm going to call this thing here as KLVB as we go along. Um, another one which is uh, much more recent is by Lee and Turner in 2016, which is to use alpha any divergence with alpha greater than one. And we'll see in a moment why alpha greater than one. But in all of these methods, so you should think of this as sort of the idealized problem, okay? But what you're actually optimizing in this case will be a uh, sum of the lower bound, and then over here you'll get a different upper bound, and so on, okay? Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. So in the first one, you're just flipping the order, but of course we know that KL is not symmetric, so they're not the same problem. And that actually has an important implication, which can be seen in this example here. So this is a toy example where, uh, let's say that the true posterior is this red uh, ellipse here. So this is the contour of some Gaussian, right? It's some uh, anisotropic Gaussian. And uh, if I use uh, the KLVB method, that corresponds to this uh, uh, green line here. And, and I'm optimizing over isotropic Gaussians, okay? Uncorrelated Gaussians. So just to re uh, uh, restate, the true posterior is some anisotropic Gaussian, so it has some correlation structure to it. We are optimizing over uh, uncorrelated Gaussians. Okay, this is a purely a toy problem. Okay, but if you use the KLVB, what it does is it exactly finds the mode of the distribution, but it you know tends to pick a distribution, a Gaussian that has a low variance. Okay, now if you flip uh, the KL order. Right, and the, uh, you look at this EP curve that corresponds to the black one with one here. Uh, you know, again, it obviously picks out the, the mode, but it picks a distribution that has a larger variance. Right, so you can, if you're worried about the spread in some sense of the, the actual, the true posterior, then maybe EP is better. If all that you care about is location, then maybe uh, in some cases KLVB is better. And, oops, sorry. Uh, and of course, alpha any sort of lets you uh, span this entire space, right? So you let alpha change, and you can, uh, you know, get different uh, uh, approximate posteriors. You can get one that exactly captures the uh, sort of the essentially the minor uh, eigenvector, and then you can get a different one that captures the major eigenvector, and so on. Okay, so. Uh, there is some utility to thinking about these methods. Again, there's no science here. To some extent, this is sort of an art, like which one do I choose? And that depends on your specific situation, okay? But again, each of these methods has different properties. They bring out different properties in the approximate posterior. So the question that sort of struck me and uh, it sort of came from reading David Bly's uh, overview of variational Bayes was, well, do we know that these approximate uh, posteriors are actually in some sense consistent in a frequentist sense? So if we collect enough data, will we actually concentrate at the true parameter in a, a sort of a parametric setting? And so uh, obviously I was not the first one to ask this. So the, this type of work has been going on for a while uh, and we found quite a few papers. Uh, broadly, I would say that asymptotic consistency has, uh, people have tried to prove this in two ways. Uh, one is by using what are called as tempered posteriors, where you sort of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is uh, something like that, that uh, if you do the algebra, you can find it. Yeah. I mean, you need that, right? I mean, otherwise, you're faced with the same problem. Yeah. And similarly over here. So in the case of uh, alpha Reni, you will get an upper bound, actually. Um, okay, so, so sort of two broad methods. Uh, you know, the first method uh, is sort of uses what are called as tempered posteriors, where you look at your likelihoods and you sort of raise them by alpha. You sort of make your uh, analysis sensitive to tail effects of your likelihoods. 
And uh, this can be used to prove consistency in some cases. In fact, this paper by Al Kure and his student, they actually prove consistency of mixtures, uh, uh, you know, when the posteriors are mixtures, whereas our results don't hold for mixtures. So we are uh, not in that setting. Um, and the other set of results, and this paper by uh, Wang and Bly uh, from 2017, I think, uh, has become quite popular. Uh, and these guys establish uh, asymptotic consistency using s sort of, uh, you know, you don't do this uh, tempered posterior thing, but then you have to do some very subtle construction, find some nice sequences of distributions to prove these asymptotic consistency uh, results. And, I, and our result sort of falls into this category here. So I'll talk about our result uh, in some detail now. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, so not the parameter, but the posterior distribution. The posterior distribution concentrates. Concentrates at the true parameter. Yeah. And so that's a, uh, you know, it's known that the true posterior distribution will concentrate as you collect more and more data. Yeah. So the question is, do, are, do these approximate uh, posteriors also have these properties? So uh, in order to prove this type of result, um, you need certain regularity conditions, right? So you have to impose certain conditions, first of all, on the, uh, on the prior uh, density. And what we assume is that the prior density is continuous with non-zero density in the neighborhood of the true parameter. And we also assume that it is uniformly bounded. So the first thing is uncontroversial, I hope, because if you don't place any prior mass on the true parameter, then this consistency question is hopeless, right? Um, uniformly bounded might be controversial, but uh, we need it to get things to work analytically. Um, we also assume that the log likelihoods satisfy the so-called land condition. And uh, technically, it's, uh, you, know, you can write it down, but roughly speaking, it behaves like a centered Gaussian as the number of samples goes towards infinity. And uh, you have a Fisher information as a precision matrix. Okay? Um, and any uh, family of log likelihoods that is twice differentiable satisfies this condition. This is proved by Lacan many, many years ago. Um, and assumption three is we need uh, Dirac delta functions to exist within our approximating family, okay? And specifically, we need Dirac delta functions to be near the true parameter theta naught, concentrated uh, near the true parameter theta naught. If that were not the case, then clearly we could not actually prove consistency, okay? Um, I would say the most controversial uh, assumption that we make is this so-called existence of good sequences. So if you remember, I said that the second method requires you to construct some nice sequences of distributions and make your arguments to these sequences. And this is where you end up at. So what is a good sequence? The family Q must contain all sequences of densities that are centered. Uh, so uh, the mean is at the sequence of maximum likelihood estimators. Right? So as n changes, you get different maximum likelihood estimators. Uh, and then they should converge. Uh, so these good sequences should converge to delta theta naught at uh, rate square root n, okay? And the tails of the densities must decay no faster than the tails of the true posterior. Um, and for large sample sizes, this sequence should be log concave-like. And these conditions might look a little obtuse, but uh, the reason we need them is to get the analysis to work. Uh, I will point out that uh, we can, we show the existence of such sequences in a number of families by construction, okay? A number of example families, so it's not like these things don't exist, okay? Um, but again, you know, this is kind of a restrictive assumption. I will admit that this is with loss of generality. But without these assumptions, we are not able to prove these consistency results. Okay, so here's our, our main result and our first, uh, first result today. Uh, so suppose Xn is an IID sequence. And under the assumptions uh, previously stated, the alpha Reni approximate posterior converges uh, weakly uh, to a Dirac delta distribution delta theta naught. Uh, P theta not almost surely as the number of samples goes to infinity. And so uh, I'll point out that since we are you know, trying to, so this goes to the question that Sandeep raised. Uh, when you say that the approximate posterior converges weakly to a Dirac delta distribution, you have to state this over all possible sequences that were generated under the true uh, data generating process. Okay, so that's where this P theta not almost surely comes in. So it might look a little bit weird, but it makes sense. Um, okay, so how does the proof go? So the proof goes uh, through a series of lemmas uh, and propositions. So I'm just going to summarize it quickly. Uh, the first uh, result that we have to show is that suppose that you have some sequence of uh, uh, densities uh, or distributions that converges to uh, some other distribution Q as n goes towards infinity. 
uh, and of course this is p theta not normal surely. Then um, this, if you look at the limb sup or the uh, the upper bound on the uh, alpha any divergence between the true posterior distribution and the sequence, that is going to be bounded above or finite. Uh, if and only if this limit q here has a singular component at theta naught. So q, the limit has to have one delta distribution concentrated at theta naught. It could have other stuff. If and only if that is true, will this uh, thing here be finite, okay? On the other hand, uh, suppose that q is a mixture of a singular component at theta naught plus some other stuff, okay? So you have this mixture of a uh, Dirac delta function concentrated at theta naught plus maybe a singular or a non-singular other component. In that case, uh, if you look at the limb inf of the same uh, alpha Rennie divergence, then this will be bounded uh, below strictly away from zero. Okay, now if you look at, if you think about the minimizer of the uh, alpha Rennie divergence, and if that minimizer is consistent asymptotically, then this thing should go to zero, right? So somehow having this extra stuff is keeping you away from this thing going to zero. So clearly, any minimizing uh, approximate posterior will not have, uh, you know, these other components. Okay, so we have some, uh, you know, structural properties now of the uh, minimizing sequence. But to prove convergence, uh, we will have to use this good sequence. So the good sequence turns out to be exactly, in some sense, what we need. It is not the uh, minimizing sequence, let me be clear. But you can show that uh, for every such good sequence, there exists a uh, number that bounds the second moment of that uh, corresponding to that good sequence. And if you look at the limb sup of the alpha uh, Rennie divergence, then uh, over that sequence, this thing is bounded above by a specific number here. And this is nice because uh, this places a restriction on the variance. We have no restrictions on uh, the uh, distributions, on the variance of the distributions uh, in our family Q. So you can find a, a good sequence that has the right M such that for N large enough, this uh, limb sup here is gonna become zero, which is exactly what we wanted. So if this good sequence uh, has this property, then clearly the minimizing sequence should also have this property, right? So then the minimizers must be consistent. Okay, so, but you can already see that this proof is uh, assuming a bit more, okay? Items one and two, now, this simply imply that the minimizing sequence should converge weakly specifically to delta theta naught. It does not have any other uh, components associated with it. Okay. So uh, if you want to prove consistency, this is how you would end up doing it if you don't make these tempered uh, posterior assumptions. So these constructions become a bit subtle, but this is one way to do it. Any questions about this? Uh, we don't have this type of result. Yeah, and it's something that we are working on. Um, the closest thing that I've seen to that might be the, uh, this, so in that Wang and Bly paper that I pointed out, they actually establish a Bernstein von Mises uh, theorem, or type of theorem. So that, but again, that's not exactly a rate of convergence result either. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's, it's not quite what you want, but I, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's different, but it's, uh, I should say it's a Bernstein von Mises-like uh, theorem. Okay. Yeah. Yes, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So, if, if there are no further questions, um, in the final 15 minutes, I'll just go back to the stochastic optimization problem. So, if you recall, um, this is what where we started, right? So, and so we sort of gone on this detour. Now, coming back, uh, we want to minimize this uh, objective here. So, this is sort of the it's usually called the Bayes posterior predictive loss. I'm just going to call it as the predictive loss. And why here is the posterior prediction? So uh, here are all of the models that could have, uh, uh, you know, that could have potentially produced this data. Uh, here's my posterior distribution, and I'm sort of predicting in the best possible way what the future sample should be. Um, and so if you take this, uh, this expression here, this integral, and you just rearrange it, Right, you just introduce the definition of f of y given xn, rearrange it, and you get this particular form. Uh, so g of a theta is something called as the frequentist risk of this model, of f of y given theta. So in Bayesian statistics, this is what it would be called as. But everything going forward will be optimizing this object here. Okay, so it, rather than thinking of uh, predictive distributions, this is sort of the utility of the Bayesian approach. 
you can now state everything in terms of posterior years. Okay. Um, so, in optimizing this posterior predictive risk, may, one may want to, or loss, one may want to worry about tail risks as well. And let me tell you why through an example. So, for those of you who don't know, if, I'm guessing everybody knows, an MM2Q is something like this. I have two servers. I have some uh, poisson arrivals. And uh, rate mu servers. And uh, service is exponential. With parameter mu. Okay? And uh, I'm going to assume that the Q is first in, first out. Um, just for argument's sake, uh, let's suppose that we know that the service rates are uh, one, and we're going to look at this Q in steady state. So what does that mean? It means that there is some arrival rate, strictly uh, less than one, that produced some observations from this Q. And let's suppose that we don't know what lambda is, and we want to, fi want to figure out lambda. So set aside the decision problem for one second. Again, think about just posterior computation. So let's say that you observe a surge on time S, and I'm going to place what's called as a non-informative prior on this parameter lambda here. And in this case, the non-informative prior is the, uh, the beta uh, distribution. Okay? And so again, you crank the algebra engine, and out pops a posterior distribution, which is relatively easy to calculate in this case, simply because we know that the sojourn time uh, likelihood is exponential with certain parameters. Uh, and it turns out that in, in many, many cases, the posterior distribution can be bimodal. Okay? You can have more than one mode in it. And uh, if you naively throw uh, KLVB at this, uh, you know, we've seen what it does. It likes to pick out the most dominant mode of the posterior. So it'll, you know, it'll tend to pick up something like this. Right? So this is the approximate posterior that KLVB is going to give you. And it says, okay, you know, a lot of the mass is down here, so I'm sort of you know, getting as close as possible to that uh, mode. But it's completely ignoring everything up here. Now, this is super important because if you're a queuing theorist, you immediately know, you know, your objective might involve the mean sojourn time, for example. So if you trust KLVB and you throw it into your optimization problem and you choose this value here to be the arrival rate, then you're saying that the mean sojourn time is like, you know, way down here. Right? Whereas in reality, perhaps it's way up here, right? And this is a super exponential increase in the mean sojourn time with lambda. So again, you have to worry about tail risk. So when you're making decisions, you have to worry about uh, you know, how, uh, which part of this uh, parameter space is super important for my decision making. And so I want in some sense to calibrate my computation of the posterior by the fact that I'm making decisions. Okay? And that's precisely where this, uh, why we want to stick a risk measure on top of our uh, objective. And there are many different ways in which you can use a risk measure on your cost. So given any objective or utility or cost, whatever you want to call this, uh, maybe not utility, but disutility. Uh, let's call it as R of A theta for now. Um, you can measure tail effects through uh, something like this, like mean standard deviation type optimization. This is very standard in operations research. So essentially, let's say pi is my posterior, and uh, I'm looking at the mean plus some standard deviation of uh, this frequentist risk under the posterior distribution. Um, but you know, why stop at two moments, right? You can keep going. You can go to higher moments if you wanted to. And the more you think about this, you realize that this log exponential risk measure essentially captures these types of effects. It's telling you how sensitive your uh, estimation should be to uh, tail effects, okay? And this uh, risk measure has been studied quite extensively. It's known to be a convex uh, risk measure. And in particular, uh, it's really nice because uh, it satisfies this classic result by uh, Donskar and Varadhan, who showed that you have this dual representation for this risk measure, okay? And you can write down this log exponential risk measure in, in this form, so depending on whether gamma is positive or negative, so either one works. Uh, let's just look at the gamma positive case. You're doing a minimization over all measures M, uh, set of all measures M, that are absolutely continuous with respect to the posterior distribution here. And you can write it down as uh, an expectation with respect to an approximate uh, measure Q plus uh, this divergence here. 
okay? And uh, of course, you know, by itself, this representation doesn't give you much. It's not, a, it's not telling you anything useful computationally. But again, let's do what the machine learners do, right? Which is choose a simpler queue, right? So restrict ourselves to some subset Q here. And uh, just look at the gamma positive case. And now we can extract uh, you know, a bunch of computational algorithms or a methodology for solving these types of loss calibrated uh, uh, optimization problems. Uh, so if you, again, you know, do the algebra and so on, I'm just showing the final version of uh, the method. And we call it as risk sensitive variational Bayes. So, and you can look at the gamma negative case as well. Uh, and this turns into a maximization because there is a negative sign up here, right? So we're gonna multiply through by negative gamma. Uh, you end up with an objective like this. I'm gonna maximize over uh, all queues and some family queue that I'm gonna choose. Uh, this objective, I get some uh, approximate uh, posterior for each A. So for each action that I can take, I have to compute an approximate posterior. And then from that, I uh, find my optimal decision, okay? So this is the entire procedure. So you, if you do this, you're sort of loss calibrating your uh, optimization or your posterior computation by uh, the uh, objective that you're trying to uh, optimize. And uh, there's a few more details about this uh, method. Uh, the set Q now, so we don't need to assume the existence of good sequences and so on for us to prove anything in this case. However, we do need, still need this so-called closure property, which says that Dirac delta functions are in there at the right location. And the second thing is it needs structure. So each of these measures in the set Q has to be light-tailed. Uh, why light-tailed? Uh, because we need to prove things, okay? As a method, you know, you don't actually need this light-tailedness. You can use it as you see fit, but if you want the guarantees that we have, then you need okay. these assumptions. Uh, yeah, if you change this around, yeah, if you change this, then you could do that, yeah. So I think there's a, uh, there's a paper by Paul Dupuis and Rami Attar where they get a Donska rather than like principle uh, where you get alpha or any over here. So, you know, you can change this in different ways. Um, some other things, uh, this R here uh, will be written in terms of G of A theta. If you recall, G of A theta was our frequentist risk capital F is some given monotone map. We'll see why we need these in a moment. Little f here, which is over here, uh, is also another monotone map. And uh, if you choose Q equals M, set R to be zero, and F of X equals X, then, well, that should, that's not quite right. Gamma should be zero. Uh, then A, R, S is the Bayes optimal decision, okay? Um, so let me just illustrate this but with a couple of examples. Um, so, we call this as a naive VB method. Essentially, you ignore any loss calibration. You, you say that I don't care. I'm just going to compute my posterior and then plug it into my optimization problem. Okay, so that's precisely the case where you set gamma equal to zero and you choose f of x equals little x. Then uh, I'm doing standard KLVB here, computing an approximate posterior, and then uh, you know finding an optimal decision uh, by optimizing this guy here. Okay. Um, and in, uh, so eventually we will want to compare this optimal decision here against the true optimal decisions. So if you knew what theta naught is, then you have a simple deterministic optimization problem, and we want to compare against this so-called oracle uh, result. And the difference, the distance between this A star NV and capital A star in, uh, uh, is, and you can define it in some way, uh, is what I call as the optimality gap. Okay, and I'll give a formal definition of this in a moment. Uh, another uh, example, again, so these are all things that people have used in practice. Uh, and in the machine learning literature, there's a paper, a couple of papers actually, that uh, talk about this loss calibrated variational base. And essentially here, uh, you choose this capital R to be log of G, and f of x is again log. And in that case, uh, you know, you get this, this form of the objective. And here you can cleanly see uh, what a loss calibration might look like. Uh, Here's the standard KLVB, and then I have this uh, sort of regularization term that depends on my objective, my frequentist risk in some sense, okay? All right, so uh, the first uh, theorem that we have is sort of a consistency result that says that, uh, and I'm only gonna focus on loss calibration, the, the second method uh, going forward, because you can state this for RSVB as well, but you know, it is nice to illustrate it this way. Um, so 
Let's look at the optimal decisions that are coming out of this loss calibration method. Then essentially we can prove that eventually as you collect more and more data, these optimal decisions are going to be within uh, the set of true decisions. Okay. So that's a sense of consistency that you can prove. It's also a sense of distance in, in the manner of speaking here. Um, more useful, I would say, is this uh, pack-based type bound that we are able to prove uh, on this optimality gap. So what do I mean by this? So, but before I can state that, I need to state some extra condition that we require on the objective. So far, we've assumed that it is, you know, it can be non-convex, but, uh, you know, it's smooth and so on. We have to now impose a growth condition. Uh, essentially, what this thing is saying, if I can parse it for you, it's saying that you can be non-convex, but you have to be bounded from below by a strongly convex uh, function. Okay, and um, uh, under this condition, uh, uh, I'd also point out that uh, so we need something like this to happen, and the c tilde if delta equals two is basically the Hessian of the objective uh, at the true parameter. Okay, uh, so under this condition, you can prove a bound of the following kind. So if I look at this uh, this distance between uh, the optimal decisions coming out of loss calibration and the true optimal decisions uh, should be capital A. Um, then the probability under the, uh, the true data generating process that this distance is bounded above by this number it depends on, is at least one minus one over tau, where tau is some number that I get to choose, some positive number that I get to choose. And this bound here depends on the KL divergence uh, in the following way. Uh, so this type of a bound is called as a pack-based bound, and it's used quite extensively in machine learning uh, to uh, give pack-type uh, guarantees on Bayesian methods. Okay, so it's very natural that in our setting we would look for something like this to give a bound on this optimality gap. Okay, um, so in the last minute, let me just illustrate this result uh, through an example. Okay, uh, so the example is the following: I'm going to use this news vendor loss function. Uh, it's this weighted sum of uh, two terms. H and B are given constants. A is my decision variable. Psi is some uh, random variable. So think of this as uh, saying that, okay, you're selling newspapers, right? And A is your decision of how many newspapers should I stack up, you know, at 5 a.m. Uh, in the morning. And Psi is the amount of uh, demand that will get realized over that day. Okay, and, But you don't get to see that at 5 a.m. You only know the number of people who turned up at the end of the day. Right, so you have to do this sort of ex ante optimization, and uh, this is sort of a natural uh, loss function because it's saying that if you overstock, there's a cost. There's a, if you understock, there's a cost. Okay, and you can't carry stock from one day to the next, right? because nobody wants to buy today's newspaper tomorrow, clearly. Okay, so uh, we'll also assume that the uh, likelihood here is exponential. Priors are chi squared; these are not conjugate. Uh, the, uh, the frequentist risk can actually be explicitly computed in this case. In fact, you can optimize it uh, under uh, when given theta naught, and you can find the op true optimal decision. For the variational family, we will choose uh, gamma distributions. And uh, the number of samples, n, is 60 in, our, in the specific example. We'll repeat this whole calculation a thousand times. Um, and then we will, uh, you know, try to bound this optimality gap. And so this is, a, just to recall, this is the thing that we're bounding. So here's the result, and let me pass this. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at this, the so-called naive VB method, and looking at how good or bad our bounds are in this uh, setting. So remember, in the naive case, we are not doing any loss calibration. Uh, these curves here are the actual 90th percentile uh, curves for, the, for this gap here, for the optimality gap, over a 1,000 iterations. And uh, this H here, uh, tells you how steep your objective is. So the uh, higher H is, the more steeper your objective is. And uh, so when H is 0 0.009, you're looking at the curve right at the bottom. When H is 0 0.001, you're looking at the first curve here. And this dashed line here is supposed to be bounding the thing down here. It should bound it from above. And you can see that it does, but it's rather quite loose. On the other hand, this line is way off the charts, literally. Um, and it's supposed to be bounding this thing here. So it is an upper bound, but it's kind of a crazy loose upper bound. On the other hand, if you look at a properly loss calibrated problem, you can see that the bounds are reasonably tight. Uh, so, of course, way down here, when you don't have enough samples, it sort of flips into a lower bound for at least one case, but let's ignore that. Okay, so let me end here, and uh, I'll just take some questions. <laughs>